sir. Thank you, and good morning, everyone. Uh, again, I'm Steve Nash. I am an anthropologist here at the Denver Museum of Nature and Science. And what I want to do on this creative morning is share with you some of the insights, the stuff in this world, the stuff about us being human that makes me think, that makes me worry, that makes me ponder, that makes me glad that I'm a sentient being. Look in the upper right up there. You may recognize that symbol. That's from a dollar bill, right? That's the evil eye. I call it, from Asian cultures, but it's in a pyramid that represents uh, Western culture and so on and so forth. A four-sided pyramid is a good way to think about what anthropology is and what anthropology does. Each of those four sides of that pyramid is a sub-discipline. There's cultural anthropology, there's linguistics, there's physical anthropology, and there's archaeology. And that four-sided pyramid is held together by the concept of culture. Now, culture is one of those things that we're going to talk about today that we all know what it is, but we can't define it. So I like to hearken back to an old dead white guy from 1871 for a, cult, a definition of culture that works. And you can read it on your own, but I'll go with you so we can emphasize some things. Culture is that complex whole which includes knowledge, belief, art, morals, law, custom, and any other capabilities and habits acquired by humankind as a member of society. Now note, that's not really a definition of culture. That's a, that's a list of attributes that culture has. But it works. It's a hundred and some years old, but this is one of the best definitions of culture that I've been able to find for this kind of context. That is me and my twin brother in 1967 <laughs> trying to acquire culture at the Field Museum. <laughs> Looking at Abeji uh, sculptures, twin sculptures from the Yoruba of Nigeria, and those twin, twins are sacred in Nigeria for a variety of different reasons. And uh, so I've been in this game for a while, trying to figure out what culture is. More presciently from the 1930s, and, and what's completely appropriate for today, is that Dr. Ruth Benedict came up with another pithy phrase that we need to keep in mind. And that is, the purpose of anthropology, the purpose of the study of humankind, is to make the world safe for human differences. That, my friends, is awesome. And let's keep that in mind as we go forth today. What I want to do with you today is to look at a variety of scientific and cultural topics through different eyes, right? Different colored eyes, different lenses, different all kinds of things. We all bring in different knowledge, skills, abilities, and so on to, to this topic. And I'd love to hear from you at the end and later on over coffee. But keep in mind, we're all looking at it from different and unique eyes. We're also looking through it, through stuff, through very specific lenses. This is Lewis and Clark's telescope. We thought that it was used on the 1803-1804 expedition until very, very recently when we looked at some of the attributes on the telescope itself. Turns out it comes from the 1830s, so it couldn't have been used on the Lewis and Clark expedition, but it's all right. It's cool. It's scholarship. We'll figure that out. But keep in mind that that lens goes both ways, right? It goes both ways. So what have I been up to over the last 10 years while I've been at the Denver Museum of Nature and Science? Most recently, just last year, uh, we published a book on the, on the Russian gem carving sculptures that are upstairs on the third floor. And if you've never seen them, they're unique, they're an icon, they're a really, really cool collection, world-class collection, the best collection of these gem carving sculptures anywhere in the world. Uh, and Rick Wicker is in the audience somewhere, our photographer. Where are you, Rick? Back over there. There he is. He took all the wonderful photo photos in there, so he is a creative morning person as well. Thank you, Rick. Um, <laughs> And thanks to a subvention from a donor, that book sells for $40 in the gift shop. The last thing that Rick and I wanted to do is publish an art book that's 90 bucks a copy and that none of our visitors can enjoy. So what's the deal with these things? There's Rick and I in Moscow. We actually went to the Kremlin. We worked with the folks at the Kremlin, had passes to the Kremlin Museum. We could walk in with our passport anytime we wanted. But there's one of Rick's photographs of one of the sculptures upstairs. <laughs> And you can't see that view when you look at it there, because that's a top-down view. Look at the vodka pulled up in his mouth. These things are genius. They're whimsical. They're cool. They're unlike anything else. There's a prisoner in another sculpture up there. None of the, the beard, that's all natural flaws in the stone. This artist could see into the stone, quite literally. And then for all you NPR nerds, the single highlight of my career is that Corey Flintoff did a story on us. <laughs> that's the man, the myth, the legend. He, he's onomatopoetic, isn't he? He looks just like he sounds. Um, <laughs> anyway, fantastic project, but not one that I thought I would be doing ever, because I'm an archaeologist. I like tromping around the American West doing things. Um, and I'm not going to go into this a whole lot today, but I do want to point out that little beast over there. That is Lukey. He's going to be our foil today. Dogs don't think about the stuff that we think about. Okay? 
At least I don't think Lukey does. Awesome dog, but you can't have a conversation about some of these topics with him. Public service announcement. We are opening Vikings Beyond the Legend exhibit here on March 10th. It runs throughout the summer. The Vikings exhibit is a trip. I'm the curator assigned to it. I knew nothing about Vikings before this exhibition, and I've been doing a lot of reading. First of all, in spite of the whole macho culture of the Vikings going out and raiding and doing nasty things to people, it was a very matriarchal society. The women quite literally had the keys to the village, right? So dudes, you think you're in control? You're not. That, that's a Valkyrie. These guys would go into battle and die, and then she gets to decide whether or not he gets to go to Valhalla. <laughs> Men, you don't have the power. One of the things that I found out, though, about the Vikings is that there was a discovery in 1836 of these dudes. These are the Lewis Chessmen discovered in the Faroe Islands uh, north of Scotland um, in 1836. These come from the 11th century. These are chess pieces. So it's first of all cool that these folks were playing chess, which came from India, we believe. But look at these things. You could sell replicas of these things till, till eternity. They are awesome. You know, the, the regal knight over there, the guy with the sword standing there, check out his eyes. What's up with that? Look at the, the, the queen over there. She's worried, right? And then there's the, the king sitting there on his throne. Look at his eyes. Something's going on, folks. Well, check out, check out this dude. So this is the metaphor for what I'm about to do today. The term berserk comes from these guys. These were warriors and it turned into a verb to go berserk, but they were the berserkers in battle. Going into battle, they would bite their shields to freak out the enemy and they would strip down naked and go berserk, right? I'm pretty sure I played rugby against some of these dudes at one point in my life. But let's go a little bit berserk with regard to science and nature here, okay? Art types. There we are, going a little bit berserk here. Art types, science types, cultural types, everybody. I want to strike home the point that the mystery isn't them, it's us. This is not about tribal folks in, in the jungles of the Amazon or something like that. All of the anthropology that we do has and should be turned right back onto us because the stuff that we do is stranger, if not more strange, than what those folks do. I want to focus on three concepts in here, time, space, and superstition. Art types, what is that? It's surrealism, it's, it's Magritte's uh, painting called Time Transfixed. And can anybody here define time? Yeah, no. no. <laughs> we all know what it is, but we can't define it. It's really hard to define time. And one of the best phrases that I heard is, time is that which keeps everything from happening all at once. <laughs> all right, that's cool. But time transfixed works because the proportions are all off. The, um, you know, it doesn't make any sense, and yet it's a snapshot in time. The locomotive has come through the fireplace. If you're Freud, you'd read that one way. The rest of us read it a different way, but the clock is stopped. That is an instant in time. So I like putting this up here when we start thinking about time uh, and conceptualizing them. This is a Lakota winter count, Lakota tribe winter count, that records Lakota history from 1789 to 1915. And so 1789 is in here in the middle, and then there is one image for each year all the way up through 1915. And this um, Lakota winter count is in our collections here at the Denver Museum of Nature and Science. We've had it for a long, long time. And in 2009, something really cool happened. We got a letter from some people in Edina, Minnesota, and in a trunk in their attic, they found a transcription of this piece that their grandfather had given to somebody who wrote it all down, they sent it to us. So we now know what everything in there means. But just to give you an example, this is the icon, the image for 1834, which is when the Perced meteor shower actually went crazy. I mean, it was, it was the, called the year that the stars fell. That's their image for it. So thinking about time, if you had the choice, how would you record 2016 in a single image? I got that one. Some of you might pick this one in the coolest hat, but the singularly worst selfie ever taken. Alec Baldwin, you got to learn. You got to look up, man, not down. Uh, but that's, I can't even say it. You all know what that is. If you're Lakota, though, what do you do? What do, you do? You, maybe you put um, the Dakota Access Pipeline protests. I shouldn't even call them protests. They were statements. 
They weren't protesting against something because it, you know, it was an incursion, incursion on their world. I don't like calling them protesters. But they did something special, and they stopped the Dakota Access Pipeline from running through their reservations and through their water sources and things. So they might pick something like the image down there on the lower right. But think about this as you go through your daily lives, where there's so full of data and information and all that kind of stuff. How would you summarize a year in your life with one single image? It's a cool challenge. All right. <clears throat> Let's take a detour over into paleontology. This is awesome. That is a fish that exploded 50 million years ago <laughs> and then was instantaneously fossilized. It's from the Green River Formation in Wyoming, 50 million years old. And that thing, what sound did that make? <laughs> right? This is paleontology. This is geological time. But that fish made a sound when it exploded. What did it smell like? I don't know. But it got fossilized right after that happened. Anybody here been to the Grand Canyon? A few of you. You all need to go to the Grand Canyon. Put this place on your bucket list. What you're looking at there is an image with the layers on top are the Tapit sandstone, right? The layers on the bottom is called the Vishnu Schist, or Zoroastrian granite has some intrusions in there. The bottom part is two, below the left arrow, uh, I mean, I'm sorry, below that line is two billion years old. The Tapit sandstone on top is only 500 million years old. There is 1.5 billion years of time represented in that image. How do we understand what 1.5 billion years of time actually is? It's really hard for humans to do, right? So I moved back here 54 feet away from the stage. Um, this is 2 billion years ago, right? Okay, let's just use that for 2 billion years ago. We go up to 500 million years ago, and that's 13 and a half feet from the stage. So what's amazing about that photograph is that all of that time, 1.5 billion years, is missing from the geological record. Why is it missing? Because there was a huge ocean that covered the world and sand rubbed back and forth over everything and eroded it all down. It's gone. So this is 500 million years ago. What about the extinction of the dinosaurs? That's 1.3 feet from the stage. Humans like us, we've been around for 100,000 years, folks. That doesn't even register out here on the stage. Two billion years. What's also interesting about this, go to the Grand Canyon, but most of the deposits down low in the Grand Canyon are named after the world's religions. Because the geologists that went down there in 1882 said these things are so majestic, so interesting, so cool, so important that we have to have everybody on the, pop, on the planet represented in the names. So it's Vishnu Schist, uh, Zoroastrian granite. I invite you, next time you're in a business meeting that's going awry, just throw Vishnu Schist in there. And <laughs> Because people are going to nod and they're going to say, yeah, that's like fail fast or something like that. That's business jargon. So put Vishnu Schist in there and just see what happens. I promise you it'll work. So that's the detour into paleontology and time depth. Here in the museum, we've got a stela, a Mayan stela, a monument from Caracol in Central America. And this thing is awesome. Um, it is a monument that's, that's, that's really, really old. This is a drawing of it. And if you get an expert in to look at it, what they'll do is they'll point out that because there is a king in here. You can see his feet, you can see his sort of dress, and he's holding a scroll, and the headdress is upstairs. That is Lord Ka'an II, all right? This monument um, over there, he is dedicating the monument to himself. So the, the, the glyphs up there, which you can read if you're an expert, say that on April 23rd, 566, that's in our calendar, not in their calendar, but that's the equivalent date, Lord Ka'an II was born to Lady Bat's Ek. Again, the ladies are important in all of this, right? The men think that they're important. It's the ladies that are more important. Uh, and then down here, those glyphs, what do they say? Lord Naranjo was defeated on May 26, 626. This is a, a, a stone monument that the Maya took the time to create. Lord Ka'an commissioned it. We do the same thing today, right? Oftentimes when people are talking about the Maya, they say, what happened to them? They disappeared. They never think those folks were successful. They built monuments like this for 900 years, folks. How old is our country? 250? How old is it in any kind of modern sense? 50? 10? The iPhone came out 10 years ago. That's sustainability, folks, right? We're all about change, all right, but we're also about fun. So Mark Zender, the guy on the left, is the dude that read those glyphs, and he's going through the glyphs. We had laid down the stela, and he says, that's the pocket gopher glyph. And being a museum curator, I said, damn, we got pocket gophers. So I went running back and brought out the pocket gopher, and we took a nice picture of us with a pocket gopher over the pocket gopher glyph. There's Lukey. I don't think Lukey cares about any of this. 
What's interesting in science, however, is that there's increasing evidence that there are truly sentient animals out there, including orcas, including elephants, and most recently, octopuses. Maybe sentient. Isn't that cool? All that Lukey cared about was that damn <laughs> pocket gopher. <laughs> All right, let's take a detour over into space. I don't want to spend a lot of time on interstellar space because I don't think that, that it's interesting, but it's not a, what I'm interested in. However, on the left is an iconic figure that you should all know about. Anybody know when that picture was taken? Apollo 8. Apollo 8. Christmas Eve, 1968. That was when the world first said WTF, folks. Because <laughs> that's when they realized that we were on a blue spaceship out there. That was the first time that we were on something way over there. Now, of course, we're getting Hubble images, which are just spectacular of the, the equine galaxies and so on and so forth. Absolutely cool stuff is happening in interstellar stuff, but I want to come back to Earth. What happened on September 1st, 1983, folks? The Russian Air Force shot down Korean Airlines Flight 007 over Russian territory. Now, what happened was it flew from New York. It had a sitting U.S. congressman on it. It flew to Anchorage to refuel. It sets out for Seoul, Korea. Um, but there were some radar installations that were out down here, and so it, it got onto a course deviation that simply compounded over time. By the time it was shot down, you know, the Russians are big bad people, right? By the time it was shot down, it had gone over Russian land, Russian um, oceans, and Russian land again. They did not shoot it down instantaneously. This was a problem, and remember, it's 1983. But what's fascinating about this whole episode for me is that the navigator, that flight was being navigated by a guy sitting in the cockpit using protractors and compasses. The military had access to GPS at that time. And as a result of the crash of the destruction of Korean Airlines Flight 007 and that course deviation, Ronald Reagan made GPS available for civilian uses. Ain't that surprising? So nowadays, oh, uh, this is a flight that I took to Moscow. Rick and I took to Moscow. Nowadays, what you can do is you can go to flighttracker.com and see exactly where you went. How cool is that? If you haven't done it, do it. When your loved one is coming in, go to flighttracker.com and you can watch them flying through the sky. You can try and wave to them, but it doesn't do a whole lot. But remember when road trips, some of you may remember when road trips required a trip to the AAA office to get paper maps? or you bought Rand McNally atlases, go do that if you haven't done it, because it's a vastly different experience from using GPS and all of that kind of stuff. So our relationships with space are changing. However, the next time you think you're having a bad day at the office, think about this. This is a Melanesian stick chart. It is a, a, an analog map of the region around the Marshall Islands in the South Pacific. The shells, the cowrie shells, represent island groups, the um, rattan or bamboo strips represent currents, wind, current, uh, wind directions, and water currents. When you apprentice to become uh, an outrigger canoe captain, what they do is they blindfold you, and they put you in that canoe, and you sail out to somewhere in the South Pacific, and then they lie your butt down, and they take the blindfold off. And your job is to sit there until you know where you are in the middle of the South Pacific by having this map in your mind and by thinking about what's going on as the, as the currents hit the wave, the waves and currents hit the thing and all that kind of stuff. And then you get up and you sail to the island that you think is closest. Amazing. And this is what humans did. This is their relationship with space. This is what the Vikings did for many, many years. And this has been documented recently in the Marshall Islands. There are p still people who can do this. So next time you think you're having a bad day, think about that challenge. That is absolutely amazing, folks. Uh, one more thing about space is that, um, did you know that the magnetic North Pole, I mean the magnetic North Pole and the North Pole, uh, the geophysical, no, geological, what's the word, geometric North Pole are not in the same place? They're two different things, right? If you use tree rings and if you use archaeological sites like this and hearths, which get baked, clay gets baked and the iron particles realign with the North Pole, if you do all of that, you can figure out where the North Pole has been through time. So let's check this out. 2,000 years ago, it was right there. At 200 AD, it was there, and then it comes around 7, 8, 900, 1,000, 1,100, 1,200, 1,300, 1,400, 1,700, uh, 1,900, 1,980. In 1980, it is on the, the North American side of the North Pole. That freaks me out, folks. But that's really cool, isn't it? Now, what's been happening more recently? 1900, it's over here. You can see there's a, a better scale. Here's Greenland. 1950, 2000, 2013. What's happening there, folks? It's moving that away. 
Why? Because of that guy. <laughs> he controls elections. He controls everything. <laughs> he controls the position of the magnetic North Pole. All right, superstition, folks. The last one I want to talk about. That figurine is known as Tapulak, and he is a figurine from Greenland. Um, and you can buy these in tourist shops all over the Scandinavian countries now. But when you've been wronged, if somebody has done something bad to you, you can carve Tapulak out of a killer whale tooth. And he's a spirit monster with a very specific function. Carve that Tapulak, and you say, Tapulak, you got to go get this dude. He did something bad to me. And then you chuck him into the ocean. And Tapulak goes and does your bidding for you. He'll go and do something bad to the person that you've cursed. The problem is, is that the person that you've sent to Pulak after, if he or she gets wind that you've done this, they'll just carve another one and chuck it back in the ocean, and then you've got to watch for Tupulak coming after you. It's a conflict resolution strategy. I ask you, is it any stranger than filing a lawsuit in federal court? No, no. It's effective. Um, so anyway, superstitions. How about those Cubbies? Anybody here from Chicago? Anybody here a Cubs fan? Okay, so there's a few of us in here. Um, Cubs, the Cubs were cursed by two things. Number one, on the right-hand side, Bill Cianis tried taking his goat from the Billy Goat Tavern into Wrigley Field in 1945, and they wouldn't let the goat in, even though Bill had bought a ticket for said goat. <laughs> and they said, nope, you got to get out of here. And Bill Cianis said, you guys are never going to win again. Right? That's 1945. 1969, the Cubs are playing against the Mets in Shea Stadium in New York. They've got the season wrapped up. They're, gonna, they're just cruising along, and a black cat runs onto the field. A black cat in a baseball stadium, <laughs> right? And it runs behind and around Ron Santo, who's in the on-deck circle. And the Cubs went into a nosedive, and the Mets went on to win the World Series. Cause and effect? I don't know. I don't know, folks. <laughs> What about this? The Cubs' magic number is 108, right? It's been 108 years since the Cubs won the World Series. 108 outs is what you need to win both the Divisional Series and the World Series, right? It's three outs per inning, nine innings, four games. It's 108. The Ricketts family, who own the Cubs, their home offices are on 108th Avenue in Omaha. <laughs> Plan developments in Chicago. City planners lay out plots and all that. Wrigley Fields was number 108. I'm just saying, folks. There's 108 stitches on a baseball. <laughs> Do you know why that's the case? Because A.G. Spaulding, who was president of the Chicago Cubs, decreed it so. There were baseballs that had more and less stitches on it prior to his decree, and he said there has to be 108. All right, what's the atomic weight of silver? 108. The World Series trophy is made out of silver. Back to the future fans out there. <laughs> It's a prediction. They said the Cubs are going to World Series. It's 108 minutes long. Now, the final one that I love is that Chicago Cubs games are broadcast from the Sears Tower, not the Willis Tower. It ain't the Willis Tower. It's the Sears Tower. And the Sears Tower is 108 stories tall. Okay, it's just a building. What's the big deal there? What's interesting about that is that the Cubs used to be on WGN, which doesn't broadcast from the Sears Tower. They switch over to the Sears Tower. Just saying, it's cause and effect, man. <laughs> People are superstitious about the full moon. Eh, anybody here a bartender, waitress, waiter? Anybody? Oh, come on, there has to be restaurant people in here. There's one over there. Do people get weird at full moons? Absolutely. Absolutely, they do. All right, so I watched um, Indiana Jones and the Temple, uh, no, Indiana Jones and the Raiders of the Lost Ark last night for the first time in a very, very long time. That is a very strange movie, by the way. But Indiana Jones at one point says, I don't believe all that hocus pocus and superstition stuff. And I'm sort of right there with him. Anybody comment on the women in Indiana Jones and Raiders of the Lost Ark? There is one. And she's tough as nails at the start. And then as soon as Indiana Jones shows up, she spends the rest of the time dressed in completely inappropriate garb. <laughs> Long white dresses. Damn, that's weird. Anyway. I try to be scientific, but I recognize the importance of superstition. So I'm not religious, but I want to end today with a series of quotes from Rabbi Abraham Heschel, because I think they encapsulate what I've been trying to convey about the mystery of humankind. So we're going to read through these together, violating PowerPoint rules, because you all can read faster than I speak. But I ask you to read these slowly and emphasize the green parts. So Rabbi Heschel said to pray, and you can also say to, to meditate, to, to have a, 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 a quiet moment is to take notice of the wonder, to regain a sense of the mystery that animates all beings, the divine margin in all attainments. 
Prayer, or mindfulness, is our humble answer to the inconceivable surprise of living. It is all we can offer in return for the mystery by which we live. Amidst the meditation of mountains, the humility of, mount, of flowers wiser than all alphabets, clouds that die constantly for the sake of God's glory, we are hating, hunting, and hurting. Suddenly, we feel ashamed of our clashes and complaints in the face of the tacit glory in nature. That's it for me, folks. Tacit glory in nature, tacit glory of nature. We are one and the same humans with all of this. Finally, all of you creative types out there, I asked students 25 years ago why we study anthropology, and I got the, you know, the usual answers kicked back from many, many different students that we study it because it's good to blah, blah, blah. A creative writing major named Mark Weaver, who I never forgot, wrote in one simple line at the end of that, why do we study anthropology? Because the epic sweep of humanity is indeed mighty cool to behold. <laughs> Damn straight. Thank you all so much for your time and attention. <laughs>